Hey, welcome to School Talks. Today, I'm with an incredible gentleman, Mr. Robert Clements, who is a columnist. He's been a writer all his life. He's he's an absolutely passionate one when it comes to writing. He's written two books, uh, at least. Well, this is called the Bob's Banter uh, Chronicles, and there's another book called Dare. Uh, it says twenty dares that helped a shiny, a shy, skinny sickly boy face his challenges head on and can do the same for you so i think this is a uh, this is one book that perhaps a lot of people can uh, relate to and we have a lot of students today with us as usual uh, at saint willie broad school we want our children to be front and center and um, this is this is an experience for them to interact with people from the real world uh, who be who have who be who are highly accomplished in many ways and then they're going to they're going to ask questions and and try and understand and and try and extract learnings out of this experience today so uh, welcome to school talks i'm so glad that you were able to make it how was your visit to the school today thank you thank you for calling me but yes i had a wonderful time uh, i'm so happy i came to the school it's so different from uh, any other school i've been to there's so much of creativity there's so much of imagination and can you believe that i came to talk about creativity and imagination and i find it's already there what wonderful job wonderful oh, school thank you it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you in the school and uh just for just to open up the conversation would you like to let us know something about you just to set the context for today where are you from what have you done how did you get into uh, into writing what do you write about what really you know keeps you all excited and energized all the time It would be nice for us to know i'm a writer just an ordinary writer i live in a world of imagination and sometimes i just pluck from there bring it out and give the fruit to other people but yes i write for the newspapers i have a daily column which i write uh, which goes which has graced about 18 newspapers all over india and also abroad uh places like uh, america uh sri lanka uh uh bangladesh pakistan and also college times that is uh dubai so it's a daily column which i write uh i have to send it by 1 o'clock to the newspapers the newspapers print it sometimes the readers get angry sometimes they're happy about what i've written i use satire as a way in which i can get across to uh people's minds in which i use humor humor is a way in which i can get to into people's minds make them laugh and then suddenly they realize hey i'm laughing at myself for what i'm doing but that's what i do as a writer and i enjoy myself that's that's really wonderful uh just for the for the benefit of our audience what 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 does satire mean you know once when i was uh, entering america they have the immigration people over there and they asked me what do you write and i said i write satire and he said satire is that what a cartoonist does and i said yes a cartoonist uses a brush i write this i do the same thing using a pen so the cartoonist makes fun of people by making a longer nose a bigger mouth maybe uh, big eyes i do it using a pen by using words which express the same thing uh make people look at something which is happening around the world look at it with laughter and then realize hey that's not right we laughed but that's not right and we think we need, we think we should change it so that's what a satirist does he writes a parallel to what is happening and makes the parallel the makes this parallel story a way in which people realize reality in the present oh well, that's that's in a way very powerful and that sets me thinking um if there is a particular situation that is isn't right in this world wasn't that just enough for people to take notice of do they still need humor in order for them to be able to see that it is not right what 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 do you think about that and humanity in that sense i'm sure there is some there's some deeper meaning to why we use humor it would be nice to know what do you think about it 
Yeah, that's so true. In the sense that uh, most of us know right and wrong. And right and wrong happens all the time, all over. Wrong happens all the time, all over. Right happens maybe a little less. But most often we like to keep quiet when wrong is happening. And what a writer does is push the person, push the reader. He already knows. He or she already knows that there's some wrong happening. But what we do is we just ignite that sense of, hey, wrongdoing which is happening and say, listen, speak up. Why are you keeping quiet? So that's that's the job which a writer does. He takes what is already there in the minds of the reader that injustice is happening and he just gives a small thought that let me do something about it. That's actually a very nice way to uh, to not be quiet, right? Because when you see injustice happening around you, uh, and it's very easy to see injustice happening around you. If you just look inside your classrooms, sometimes inside your own families at home, maybe the way your elder brother or your elder sister or your younger brother is treated, uh, it's easy to see injustice if you're looking for it. And then, as as uh, uh, Mr. Clement said, most of humanity and mo almost everyone is silent when when injustice happens. Uh, but a writer decides to write about it so that he can push people to think. Um, and I think an approach he uses is through humor, which I think is very powerful in that sense. Um, so w would it would it be okay for me to to assume that the intention of satire is positive? should be used positively and most times it it is but then i've also seen that uh, you can use it negatively uh, after all when we want to ridicule somebody how do we do it we crack a joke right we make fun of them so satire is like that it should be used positively but uh, very often we can use it uh, both ways it's like we have hackers and we have the best of AI and other tools which have come out, which could be, which the world needs to know can be used positively. But then we have this bunch of people who use, uh, who you can use it negatively. Anything can be used negatively. So we need to differentiate between how we're going to use it. It's a tool. And uh, once we are able to differentiate, it's like what I talked about today to the teachers, in which I brought in the fact that finally it's about using truth. Finally, it's about using light to be used to use our talent of writing to bring light to the world and to bring truth also to people. Very interesting. I very very similar to what you said. Um, there was this uh, story that I read in uh, in a journalism college in New York. There was a there was a young journalist who wrote a story, and she brought a lot of bad news into the into the into the story death and killing and you know violence and really really like gory stuff and the um, her editor her, her teacher told her I don't want to publish this story I don't like the way you've written it and then they asked why because this is going to get so much of attention so many likes so many forwards you know so many so many people are going to comment on it this is going to be great it's going to be it's going to go viral and then the uh, uh, the, the, the professor uh, told her if you're writing something, I want you to write something about hope. I want you to write something that gives people hope, gives people chance at living. I want people to know that they're in a beautiful world, a world filled with promise. It doesn't have to be filled with lies, but the way you approach a topic. So in the same way, I want to ask you, like, uh, when you write, right, um, as you as a, as a writer, as you as an individual, with your own identity, and you have to write every single day, uh, what is it that that you try to bring into this world through your writing? I'd like to take off from what you said, and it's a very interesting point. The first thing that happens to us as writers is that we look at the world and say, hopeless, horrible. We want to focus on the bad. But something I realized as I went along was the world knows that there is bad. 
So when you're focusing on the bad, you're just reinstating and just reiterating and telling them all over again that, hey, things are bad. So what finally we need to do as writers is also to present the solution. We need to tell them, listen, there's bad, but this is the good you can do. And that was the eureka, the turning point in my uh, life as a writer when I realized that I need to find the solution. I shouldn't just be presenting the negative and the horribleness of a situation, but I need to know, tell people where, where they can go. And that was uh, uh, what you said about that writer in New York was exactly how we all start our careers. Talking about the negative, talking about how hopeless the world is, talking about the fact that nothing, uh, you know, uh, things can't change. And then you realize that your job here on earth, with the talent that you've been given by God, is to tell people, here's the solution. Here's where you can change it. That made a lot of difference to my everyday writing. Giving people hope. That's beautiful. Does that... Uh you know, get you to ask any any questions from, from there or you want to supplement or add anything to that? Does this speak to you? Yes. So, I am going to ask a few questions. So, sir, when you were in our age, did you ever think about becoming a writer? When I was your age. How old are you? Um, I am 15 years old. So, eight years before 15... I remember walking down the street. I grew up in Bangalore, walking down a particular street and saying, one day when I become a writer, this is what I'll do. So I think the idea of being a writer, luckily for me, it wasn't a change in career. Luckily for me, started from the time that I was very young. And also, that was the only reason that the teachers passed me in class because I was so bad at arithmetic, I was so bad at all the other subjects, but in writing I scored. So the teachers thought that if this guy could write well, obviously he's got some brain somewhere. So at seven, that was my only lifeline to pass every year from one class to another. So yes, it was always there. And who inspired you to start writing a story? From the beginning, my dad and my mom saw to it that I had a lot of books to read. We were not very well off, but for that particular reason, my mother decided not to work as a secretary, but to work in a school as a, a, a teacher so that she'll have access to the library and get me back books. And we had a thing called the USIS, which is the American Library. And my dad would see to that he would pick up books, uh, biographies and autobiographies of different people and bring them home so that I could get inspired and write. So he brought at some stage so many biographies of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was an architect, that I started thinking, hey, I'm going to be an architect because I read so much about him. And then I realized that architects need, need to know mathematics. So I went back to being a writer. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant. It just it just goes to show that so many experiences we have as children, you know, really have a formative and in many ways like it shapes our our future careers and um yeah. People say that uh, when you ask great people why did you do what did you do, a lot of the time it comes out that it's 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 the experiences they've had as children, the childlike faith or the childlike experiences that they've had, the fascination that they've had as a child, which which to me tells me that you guys should be off your phones and really experiencing more of the world because you never know what could fascinate you. And something that could fascinate you might eventually take you into, uh, into a life of meaning and contribution to this world. Do you have any other, anything that you'd... I like that question. 
You and I like that question. The reason I like that question is because you've taken it away from writing as a way just because I want to write to writing into somebody else. Like there's someone else going to read it and how is it going to impact that person? I think that's a, it's a brilliant question. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I, have a, I, have, I have a class for writers and something I tell them very often is when you're writing, become the reader. Exactly what you said. In fact, you answered my question. Jump across the desk of where you keep the laptop. Jump across to the other side and look at your writing. If you're writing a play, look at the stage even as you write the scenes. Watch the characters going by. In other words, write for the reader, not just for yourself. If you want to write for yourself, open a di uh, 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 write a diary every day and say, Dear Diary, this is what mommy said to me. This is what daddy said to me. But you want to write a book? you got to sell your writing. you got to imagine something that the reader wants to find palatable. Then you become a good writer. Excellent. But you answered it yourself. Wonderful. Uh, one more question I would like to ask that. Uh, as you are telling about the creativity, uh, so what would be the role of creativity in the leadership and life uh, in general, if we ask, or if we say about it. See, creativity is all about imagination. Imagination is all about getting away from this level which we are in now and moving into our mind, which takes us into imaginative stages. It, let's just look at the school. This is actually, where I heard it's supposed to be part of a mall, a shopping mall. Somebody built a mall, right? And somebody thought it could be a school. Somebody had a terrace and somebody thought that it could be made into a, uh, into a playground, it could be made into a hall, it could be made into a place where 300 people could sit and where children could play. What happened? All that happened was somebody became creative. They went into a dream world. To be creative, you have to go into a dream world. When you go into a dream world and when you have structures of reality to the dream world, you produce results. So dream, but also base your dream on reality. Okay? So leadership, you were talking of leadership. Leadership needs to have dreamers. And that makes good leadership. That makes powerful leadership. When you have people who dream and people who are able to structure their dream well. Sir, what inspires you to write stories? You know, that's a question very, uh, very many people ask. Like, okay, how do you write a column every day? How, do, how are you able to think of characters and so on? It's a, it's, it's a question which I'll answer in all humility with just uh, one thought which I put into anybody's mind. The same way that an accountant is able to do well in account. The same way an engineer is able to do well in engineering, the same way that anybody who decides to get into a profession excels in it, God has given a writer this ability to think thoughts which inspire him. That's all. So the, if you can't write, but if you can imagine a building, if you can't write, but you can imagine being a chartered accountant, if you can't write, but you can still imagine yourself doing any other profession, that's as good as me writing a column every day. That's all. It's a gift. Now, the, uh, th uh, another thought which I'd like to put is, you all have gifts. We all have gifts. How we make use of this gift is important. We all have gifts. Some of us, like you know, the biblical story of the talents, I don't know if you've heard it. One person was given 10 say 10 rupees, another person was given 5, another person was given 1. The person who was given 10 rupees made it 20. The person who was given 5 made it 10. And the person who was 1 hid it under the ground. A lot of us hide our talents under the ground and don't do anything about it. I would tell you right now, take that 10 and make it 100. Make it 1,000. Or like Bill Gates, makes it, make it a billion. And you've got all the opportunities in today's world to take that and do well with yourself. Sir, what problems did you face while writing a story? What problems did I face when I was writing a story? My mind. 
the very mind which is producing the story told me, hey, isn't there something better to do? Can't you go out and is it, is it, can't you go out and do something else? The mind which gives you the ability to do well also gives you the ability to be distracted. So you have ability and disability going side by side. So all the time you have to consciously tell your same mind which is telling you to do well, to work hard, to come first, to be an engineer, to be the best in your field. You have to tell the same mind, I will not get distracted. And the biggest distraction today is our cell phone. So this you do to overcome the obstacles. Pardon? So this you do to overcome the obstacles. I have to work on it every day. Two days back, I made up my mind that I will look at my phone only for phone calls and only for uh, messages. I said, I have, I have to spend my time thinking. I shouldn't spend my time being distracted by Facebook and distracted by every other message, uh, every other uh, bit of entertainment that comes. No. Let me read history if there is history, if there's something which I like reading. Let me use my phone for supplementing my writing for something positive, but not as a distraction. So I had to positively make a conscious decision about this. Sir, uh, as uh, the war between many countries like Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Gaza is going on. So what is your thought? What is your thinking on it? I've written a play on this. And the play, uh, it's about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And the play has been taken, it's been bought by an Australian company. And hopefully that play will uh, be made into a, it'll go further from off the stage and get into being a, a serial. And what I've said in the play is what I'm going to tell, tell you about is that the same way that we invest our money in arms and ammunition, the same way peace is not a natural thing within us, it has to be invested into. We have to invest the same amount of billions of dollars or money into peace. And when we invest into peace, then we see great gains. And what I'd mentioned in the play, just for an example to make it a little easier, is the fact that we need little, little villages where people of different communities and faiths are put together who will be allowed to live for six months at a time together in Israel, what is called the kibbutz. Uh, and they will live together and get to know each other. And as they get to know each other, they'll find that they're brothers or they're sisters. And there's nothing different, which is why one of the papers I write for is Pakistan, which is not uh, or something most a lot of people are happy about. But I write for a particular reason. I write for the reason that they also are humans, uh, beings like us and brothers and sisters. And if we're able to get into that mode of thinking, the world would be a peaceful place. But that needs an investment also. What do you think about uh, countries who are having arms and weapons to fight? See, arms and weapons are needed by the countries they feel uh, to, to be able to threaten another country that we've got stockpiled so much of weapons so that you better be careful. And But which is maybe one way of looking at peace, but also remember that the more weapons that we go on piling up, the less education there is, the, the, the less the poor people might be getting uh, food, the less education there is for people for some people to uh, be able to go to schools and so on. So, isn't there a better method? Isn't there an easier method? Rather than, you know, uh, like I build muscles and you build muscles and we spend time in the gym building muscles so that you feel you feel threatened by me and I feel threatened by you. Couldn't I spend some of that time in something better than just building muscle? Maybe build a brain.
Absolutely. One of the problems about people who are creative is that we are not very good at finance. One of the ways that I got over it was that I got married to a doctor who is very good with detail, who tells me when I'm overspending and tells me that, you know, you better be careful, Bob, or puts me on the right track. Uh, but yes, living in a world of fantasy, you also need to have your feet on the ground. And when you have both, and you have brilliant people like that, Bill Gates, brilliant with creativity and brilliant in also being able to financially make his creativity viable. You have to learn both. And it's a beautiful question. Thank you. Which type of surrounding is required while writing a story? We all think, isn't it, that having a home by the sea and having waves rolling uh, by will, will produce greater creativity. I like to think the same way. But I found one thing, and I saw this happening with a few of the writers who were friends, uh, who are doctors, and who produce great books, that some of the greatest books they produce were between surgeries, which meant that they were in an operation theater, had saved a life, and then gone back and written a few lines. And that's when, and I read some of their books and they were brilliant. And they, it's not that they were technical books or books on medicine or so on. They were novels. And I thought that you do not need a place which is the best place. Because when you have a place which is the best place, you still won't write. When you want to write, you take any place and you'll write. So there's, I believe there's no place that you can go to except that place in your head in which you can retreat into, take up your pen over there and start writing. So, what is the essential part of a story? What is the main? That's a difficult question to put simply because there are so many parts of a story which are all essential to make it good. So if you're talking of the essential part of a very good story, I would say that you need all these ingredients to make it good. One is you need a beautiful setting. Okay? You need a very good setting. You need a place where if you're going to if you're going to talk in terms of a tale unraveling, you need a fireplace. You need somebody who's sitting over there with maybe a pipe in his mouth. Why? Because we're trying to make the readers also relax and go into that place where we're creating the story. So the setting is most important. Then we need characters who will finally face the, uh, face the problem and be able to bring a solution. So those characters, it's, you know, this is so important in storytelling. We just bring in a character. We just bring in a character. We bring in a protagonist. We bring in a villain. We bring in all these people and we hope the story will unravel. But we don't realize that little by little by little, we have to bring the hero. We have to bring muscle into the hero. Why? Because finally he's going to slay the dragon. Initially, he didn't have the muscle to slay the dragon. The story is all about how he developed muscle to slay the dragon. You get it? And the villain... You don't bring him immediately in as a villain. You show him as a nice chap. But once in a way, he looks and does something wrong. And the, it's like opening a riddle and the readers say, A, he's not as good as he is. So there's the buildup of a character. Then you need the conflict. And most of us make this, I have this problem. We forget the conflict when we are writing. We, uh, I see it in my cast. I didn't see it much of it in your stories. Excellent. I think you've been told how to do a story. But that story also has to be as strong as the villain and as strong as the uh, hero that you've got. The conflict also has to be a strong conflict. You can't have a little conflict and you build up great characters. So you build up great characters and have a huge conflict. And in the conflict, 
the hero and villain should be more or less evil, uh, more or less equal. I'm so sorry, not evil, equal. Freudian slip. They have to be. They have to be equal, and there has to be suspense as to who's going to win, and then you decide whether you want to make it a tragedy. You can make the villain win, or you can make the other one win. So then there's the conflict, and then the resolve of the conflict, and the end of the story. Most of us, I'm still uh, holding on to the story part, but most of us have this problem, or rather this uh, sad solution of bringing an end to the story somewhere, if you're doing a 20-chapter book, of looking for a solution in the 18th chapter. You know where the solution to the story starts? At the beginning of the book. The conflict starts from the beginning of the book. It's a build-up to the conflict. That makes a good book. So the solution to your conflict starts right from word one, chapter one, and then it goes on. I wanted to just pitch in and say a couple of questions that I heard you guys ask, right? One was, what's the right place to write a story or what inspires you to write a story? I think um, from what I what I hear from um, Mr. Clements is, it's not the experience that comes first. It's the decision that comes first. Like when you take a decision that, okay, I want to write or I want to do something and maybe through, you know, through my linguistic contribution, I'm going to do something, right? Once you take a decision, then I think uh, everything else follows. Uh, it's not necessary that something has to really happen and shake the core of you and then, or something inspires you that way. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of uh, um, drama, I think, that we all associate to things like that. I need to be inspired or I need to be pushed or I need to be motivated or something. I think I think it just happens on an everyday basis. In fact, I'll interrupt you here by telling you an instance. Exactly. Uh, my closest friend is a writer also. Uh, and we both decided that we'll go to New York and we'll do a book called 50-50. He would write 20 short stories. I would write 20 short stories. Now, he's a novelist. He's uh, got a book in Penguin, another one in HarperCollins. Uh, and we were classmates when we did our literature, where we did our master's many, many years back, about 100 years back. So we went to New York. <laughs> so we went to New York. And my daughter said, who's in New York, said, Dad, I'm going to have a flat kept for you right in Manhattan, near Central Park, couldn't be better, skyscraper, from on top of the skyscraper, I could even see luxury, uh, these uh, ships over there. And both of us decided this is the right place for us to write. We are here together and we'll start our book. Not a word was written. Not a word was written. Right place, best friends, both novelists, but we didn't write a word. So don't look for a place. Just start right now, wherever you are. I would. Uh, uh, there is a question that is coming to my mind that as the world is changing, so how do you think that the writing will evolve in the future, especially with the rise of the AI? Uh, it's a very nice question and people are getting all bothered and unnerved by this. But... You know, when I look back, when computers came, when computers came into India, especially, I, I don't know if you remember, but everybody and everybody, industrialists, railway people, government employees, all got scared and saying, finished, it's over. Hmm. That's the end, our jobs are gone, we'll all be on the streets, we'll be unemployed. But what happened? Computers enhanced our working. It made it better. When we as writers learn to be able to use AI and use it in, the, in a positive way, it'll just make better books. And we have to understand, it's just that, you know, you have to give a little bit of leeway to we from the, from us from the older generation because we are scared. But you shouldn't be scared. You should be able to say, I've got creativity and here's technique. Let me use my creativity and, and let the uh, technique enhance my creativity. You understand what I'm saying? 
Let me use tea. Like we had logarithm books when we were small. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Log books. And then came calculators. And suddenly we found we don't need those log books. So the same way, use AI and then use your natural God-given talent. Use it together. You'll go, instead of like me going one step ahead, you'll go 10 steps ahead. Just an, another question that, uh, how do you know that your writings are impacting the lives of the people? I'm lucky in that. And it, it's so uh, such a wonderful question. I'm lucky in that, that uh, we have what we call letters which come back to us. Uh, my email address is put at the end of my column, which goes to different uh, papers. And they write back to me. And th those letters mean, I was uh, the, in the talk which I had this morning with the teachers, I realized that those letters mean more to me than anything else that writing has given. Because finally, it's all about the reader. And finally, if you're talking of the word impact, it is how much of light I'm throwing to my readers through my writing. How much of light... So, in, in our school, we have several innovative activities or projects like learning how to make our own book. So, sir, would you like to give few advice to a young author so that they can start working on their first story? Wonderful. About a month back, uh, my daughter's two children came back from, uh, came down from America. They're twins. They're just six years old. They came. And uh, with uh, American accent and all that, because they're living over there. They've grown up there, they're born over there. And there's one of the twins loved being with me up in the morning in my garden. And he would, we would watch the birds. And he's a little bit of a, uh, a boy with a lot of activity. So I taught him the way of being still and sort of looking around at the birds and enjoying the garden. Now, the other twin was different. He was into his own world and so on and so forth. Towards evening, towards night, the boy who was with me in the, ma, in the garden would tell me, tell us a story. And I would have to tell him not one story, but two stories, but three stories. And then only they would go to sleep. The other boy, the other twin, would say, I don't want a story. Please go to the other room and say, tell a story. I want to sleep. Now, what did I do? I, I initially, I thought, oh, no, if the guy doesn't want to hear my story, let me go to the other room. I, I mean, come on, yeah, I'm your grandfather. You need to hear my story. You don't want to hear my story. I was very insulted. But uh, I decided that I'll tell the story into in their same room, but I'll say it softly. So, you know, softly is a stage whisper. A stage whisper is loud enough for everybody to hear. And I decided that I will gain that boy, that twin, that grandson as one of the people who would be interested in my story. And the first day he went to sleep. The second day I saw him listening and my story was aimed at him. I knew I had a ready-made reader already in the first grandson. Slowly, 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 I'm coming to your question. Slowly, 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 he started getting interested. And he would start laughing. You know, a small little snigger. <laughs> he has to show that he hasn't laughed because he's trying to show that he didn't hear the story. I'm so sorry. But he laughed and he heard the story and slowly got interested. And finally, one fine morning, he comes to me and says, I want to write a book. The boy who doesn't like stories says that he wants to write a book. And then I took sheets of paper, folded it into, uh, uh, into 16 sections, and we made it into a book. And the book was about the squirrel and the dolphin. Now, entirely his story. He's only six years old. And he started. And we started with a thought. He would come to me and he would give me the thought. And then I would tell him, a little bit of the outline. And he wrote 10 chapters. So how did he start with the book? He started with the book. 
by listening to other stories. Now, uh, you, you, you can't go and push your grandfather or anybody else and say, give us a good story, but you can pick up good books. When you read those stories, and when you look at those stories, you just say that, let me write a story just like that. And then you write a good story. And sir, what are the key points that are necessary to write a story? I would say just two things which we have already talked before. One is, jump across to the other side and be a reader. The second is, use those uh, four points of, you know, the setting, the character, the event, or, or the, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, the plot. Yeah, the conflict. The conflict. Yes, the conflict. And finally, how you sort out the conflict. I think uh, when I listen to you ask these questions, uh, and also when I'm when I'm taking in everything that Mr. Clemens is saying in terms of uh, conflict, yeah, yeah, and the fact that conflict needs to be introduced um, pretty much in the first chapter, and then you build that conflict, you know. Um, I think as students, many of you are in probably the first or second or third chapters of your life right now. Are you able to see it that way? You think you are in the first, second or third chapter in your life? Yeah? Well, beginning of life, right? Like most of you. And very soon you're going to probably get into conflict with parents, with authority, with, um, you know, with, with, with your teachers or I don't know. I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just saying you're going to get into conflict. <laughs> There will be things you want to do that maybe your parents don't want you to do or, you know, things like that, right? And and just hearing from Mr. Clements, I think now we can all be a little more aware of when we see conflict coming up or we can all be aware a little more about how conflict is building up, right? And if you're able to see conflict as conflict and if you don't feel that you are in the story. Although it's happening with you, but you don't have to feel you're in the story. I think that might give you a lot of more, lot, that, that might give you a little more power over the situation. That awareness, that situational awareness to know that, oh, this is conflict and there's a protagonist and, you know, this is a villain. <laughs> and, and, and this is the setting. This is a scene. This is a story. It's building up here. And then if you start thinking that you, you're the writer, you could write your own story. You could write your own ending. You could write your own. You could rewrite the story if you want. Right? Fascinating. I think what you're saying is like, uh, you know, we writers have this habit of looking at everything. Like I would look at this as a story setting scene. Okay. Now what you're suggesting, and it's so beautiful, is looking from the other end of the telescope and looking at the story and saying, is that forming for me? From our stories, learn about life. Isn't it? Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful thought. I've never thought of that yeah. that way. But beautiful. Be really nice because I see so many students feeling like they're victims. Oh, dad doesn't want me to do this. Or mom doesn't want me to do this. Or dad doesn't want me to be with that friend. Or, or wear this clothes. Or, you know, things like that. And then you start feeling like you're the victim. Start feeling like, you know, am I the only one doing everything wrong? But if you're able to look at yourself as the as the architect of that story, as the as the writer of that story, if you're able to see, you know, there's a story. Yeah. It's a conflict. And you should be happy there's conflict. And I can change your line. You can change your line. <laughs> exactly. You change the ending. You can change your line. You can add meaning. You can you can have so much more. Suddenly you feel like there's so much power that you have that you thought you didn't have. And then you can just change the story. And if you feel like your dad is not being, you know, that great of a villain, you can go and tell him, give him some ideas, how to, you know, how to write a good story. <laughs> so there's a story forming everywhere, is what I feel. Perhaps, yeah, the, the, something that uh, the two punning words is real life and read life. Mm. They're so <laughs> into each other, isn't it? Yeah. Does that spark another question or or another idea in your mind? I would like to ask that, as you said that the mind is the creator and the mind is the distractor. So, if you are writing a book on justice, but your mind is thinking about liberty, at that time what you do to cut that distracting 
of your mind and come to the same point which is justice yeah that's uh, i think it's a brilliant question well the just the fact that you brought in two things like uh, justice and liberty what i would do and i tr- truly have to do this you know very often because sometimes i have newspapers which ask for a column of 500 or 600 words and then the same day another newspaper which is talking about 1000 or 1100 words uh so let's say that i've written now like yesterday i did write a, a column on boredom okay now what do i do about the newspaper which asks for 1200 words so i just bring in a topic which is very close to boredom and then i join it together and make a 1200 word article out of it now coming back to liberty and justice i would say that these are two uh ingredients that would go well into any kind of a story one is in a liberty is when we want to be free and we can be free only when there's justice right so i don't have to stick to justice i am able to take two two ideas and make it into one thought liberty and justice are close we can even bring in equality and inequality equality and slavery how do we bring it together you know you asked a lovely question but this is writing this is writing when you have two groups of people who are talking two distinctively different things but you see the connection in your mind because remember children that writing is not about words and writing a composition writing is all of also about getting the ability to analyze people analyze a book and bring it down to 1 plus 1 is 2 oh that's what it is it's just as simple as this and then you present it to the reader so when you are able to take two uh, discussion going on which is going on hammer and tongs to each other you come and say hey listen you know something you both are talking about the same thing it's called discernment and it's a wonderful quality to develop to be able to look deep analyze and understand and discernment i think you as uh, children you need it also as you talk to people as you talk to adults as you talk to other children as you go up in life as you go on meet get into jobs and so on learn to discern learn to be able to not be suspicious of people but be able to understand and you might find that people are not arguing that they're both on the same side that's discernment but beautiful question yeah that was a nice question and i just want to ask you do you guys uh, have you have you seen superman Okay. And who's the hero? Yeah, and you've seen Batman. And who's the hero? Right. And I think it's so easy for all of us as students and as children uh or even even adults to look at a movie and look at the hero. Right? The hero is the person who you know, takes power over evil and and is is doing something very heroic. right on screen very easy for us to look at that person as the hero but if you really have to think who do you think is the hero when it comes to superman you know who do you think is a hero uh in my opinion hero is the person who helps guide other person to make his or her life into a next level beautiful is that very visible means can you see a hero yes give me an example uh for example dr apj abdul kalam very visible character very very visible he, very 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 well known personality he gave he in his most of the speeches he said only one thing he informed that just focus on what you are doing no matter what the, no matter what others are saying just focus have a belief on your goal so i feel a person who helps other who helps 
others in their way if they are going to a wrong track who guides them to be in on the right track so that would be a hero yes so i'm asking you the question again is a hero visible yes okay if you ask dr abdul kalam who was his hero what do you think he would say i don't know you don't know i'm saying what would you think he would say uh he would say that his hero father yeah do you know who his father is no abul fakir it's not very visible he's not a very visible character yes yes he's yes. not a very well known personality but for him he absolutely a- and so i think that's what i'm trying to get at what i'm trying to say is it's very easy for us to look at a hero in a story and say that's the hero 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 is the guy who's only alive at the last page last page pe jiska naam hai wo hero na <laughs> simple hack right but the point i'm trying to make is like i think we have to be able to see heroes in other people who are invisible who may not be so famous not all heroes wear capes you know what i'm saying right so authorship being a writer writing something that's just a figment of one's imagination then you made a story which then people adopt and people hold as if it's true right and people hold on to that and then they hold on to that fictional character and say that's the hero right if the hero is fictional that means the hero is in us you know what i'm saying there's some part of that hero that we relate to yes and a whole lot of people behind that were not visible are heroic in that sense in in, in that sense so what i want you to understand is not everyone who speaks the most or who's most visible or who you know whose reels uh, you know are most liked could be heroes right there were so many other people that we need to go and find these heroes inside and one of the things that mr clemens spoke to us was about thoughts like a, a a writer first has to be a thinker the first thing he has to be a thinker he has to be an observer to observe and think and then what's he thinking he's thinking based on experience wisdom he's thinking based on right and wrong morality values so he's discerning there's a you know it's a it's a mature process of discernment i thought about age it's about all of you can start you know really really choosing and thinking and comparing and and discerning right you you want to discern it something so i'd like you to also think about you know all the different heroes who don't get limelight all the different heroes who are among us or all the different heroes that we could be so you could be a hero in thought leadership you know if you have to explain thought leadership to them what do you how would you I'll, think I'll about just it just yeah sure 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 back. take it away so i like to start i'm i'm going to we are going to write a book called unheard melodies this is so close so so close to what you're talking of unheard melodies comes from uh, keats you know who was a poet john keats was a poet and he's uh, one of the lines that he said in an ode to a nightingale or ode to a grecian or i'm not sure which poem is heard melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter still heard melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter still and when you talk of who is the hero we have a father who is a hero we have the ma- a mother who is a hero we have an uncle who might might have come into the city or a father and mother who came into the city worked hard and gave us a good education he's a hero but they are unheard melodies nobody talks about them nobody writes about them nobody sings about them and we are bringing out a book in which we are going to talk about these unheard melodies of heroes so coming to what you said when you watch a movie you might see that unseen hero in that hero in the movie you might see dad you might see a friend you might see yourself and if you come out of a movie with your shoulders back which my skinny shoulders those days uh used to go back you know when i used to see a movie i used to come out who was the hero me because it inspired me and i'm not joking i came out of those movie halls feeling that i also can win the world 
So I loved your question. Who's the hero? The hero is you who comes out of there changed. And as a writer, when you realize this, and we realize that you have to connect your hero to what the reader also is, you write better. You don't make the reader into somebody in the spaceship going out there with super muscles and looking like a, a person from Mars yeah. or somebody. No, normal, ordinary person like you and me, he does extraordinary things. Who's the hero? You. Lovely. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, as he said, that uh, the hero is the, for the, uh, the uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, the hero was his father, but also the street lamp, which helped him to study about science and lighten his future with the, uh, with the rays he put on his head and put on his books is also, and also the street lamp is also the Hero for him. But a lovely thought. But look at it one way. Abdul Kalam's place, how many street lamps were there? There must have been at least 100, 150,000. How many people studied under that? The same way. Each one of us is blessed with a gift. How many of us are using it? We all can become heroes. How many of us are becoming heroes? I also think you need to understand the first, the very first thing that Mr. Clement said is each one of us already blessed with a gift. We think we are not blessed with a gift. We think only that person is blessed with a good voice. That person is blessed with money. That person's, you know, blessed with good looks. That person's blessed with, you know, these different talents. We don't even start thinking that we are blessed already. And it's just that we don't know what talents and what blessings we have already. And I think just being aware of that gives you so much more power than you have today. And with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. What are you going to do with that power? And I also think that, you know, with this question of who's the hero, inside your classroom, you go inside your classroom, you have 40 students there. And if everyone's making fun of this one child, is there a story? Are you able to see a story there? Yes. What's the story? What do you think is coming up there? Conflict. And, yes. who's, and who's the who's the story there? Who's the hero there? We ourselves. No, the crowd. Okay, who the crowd. Who's making fun of him? Could looks very heroic, right? Looks yes. like they're powerful. And who's 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 the the victim there? Uh, we. We. Tell me more. The person who is getting funnied by others. Okay. Is the victim. Okay, so people who the the person who's being yeah made fun of or ridiculed is the victim. Can you change that story? How could you change that? First of all, just knowing the story exists there. Right? There's a story forming right yes. there inside your classroom, in front of you, in fourth period. <laughs> Gets real, right? <laughs> How could you change that story? And first of all, I want to ask you, as a St. Willie Broad student, who would you be a friend of? Would you be a friend and follower of the person who's making a fool of others? Who would you be a friend of? Uh... A student who is helping others and respecting everyone, whether it is elder from him or younger from him. All right. And in that situation, in that story, like four or five students, all, you know, the, the big bosses of this classroom, all, you know, good looking guys with a lot of, you know, uh, accolades, well in grades, whatever. And they're making fun of this one child. Are you going to be... Who are you going to be friendly with? If you are a St. Willy Broad student, you are going to be a friend of whom? Uh, sir, the fact is, they not only, means, not everyone will make fun of him. Not everyone will make fun of him. Everybody have different perspective to see the world. Therefore, 
there were there might be some children who oppose oppose opposes this thing this type of bullying so therefore he should be friend with or i will be friend with that person who opposes this things and if you want to be a friend that's a very nice thought and it's it to me it really shows that you want to you want to ally with the victim you want to ally with the victim and with other people yeah who are standing against that injustice what if there's no one what if there's no one standing against what are you going to do are you going to wait for someone uh who would you be a friend of i would be the friend of the victim and uh, say him or told him that you are not the victim you are the hero who are fighting against these students who are bullying you and you are the one only uh, the hero of the story who is going to fight this and who is going to show them that you are not the, uh, you are not that what they are thinking so i got an idea that's a perspective yeah uh sir this story seems similar to the story of dr apj abdul kalam he used to get bullied by some of the students in his class but he overcome it by ignoring because as i said no matters what others say the thing is focus on your goal he focused on his goal and see he is a great scientist he also used to get bullied but by overcoming it by ignoring them because if you will try to understand them if you will try to understand them you will not get the perspective you will not get the perspective uh, you will not know he or she is understood by your words so a person should try to overcome the obstacles by focusing on their goals but there's one person missing in your talk there's a victim there's somebody who is bullying the victim and there's a third person who is that there's a third person who was brought into that story who is that person what is that person's role what should he or she do that, that's the question we're not talking of the victim we're talking of the third person who's the third person who has me yes and that is the question that is being asked what is your role there what do you join the people persecuting yes you would because some quite often we do that that's is what uh, mr billy broad is saying that most often we do that we join the person but what is your role we are not trying to enhance the wisdom or no we are not trying to glorify the victim we are trying to ask what will be your role over there what who are you there the hero or the joiner of the victimization of the victim in my opinion there are two types of things it's something to think about yeah you know this is when when you hear something like that you want to think about it before you respond because sometimes when you just let it rest you know it gets better you are able to see it differently so i would recommend you let it rest for some time just let it rest and watch and watch that grow and here's coming back to i like this thought coming back to how you could use maybe you're a weak person maybe all of them are stronger person how do you then use what muscle you have and i'd like to come back down to that i uh, in the fact that one weapon that i used throughout school was a gift of writing if i saw bullying happening i used the power of poetry we didn't have xerox machines those days we had cyclostring machines that was too costly for me so i would rewrite the poem again and again into five sheets and pass it around the class powerful writing about the bully and you won't believe it you won't believe it i heard it later that they were scared to hit back at me though they could have thrashed me because they knew that tomorrow i could write another poem <laughs> and that is where you need to use your writing to be use your speaking to be able to stand up for the right the third person is you but what is the muscle you're going to use 
is the talent you're going to have. So much is so that that same person, the bully, I stood up for once when I was writing. Uh, he he. I, 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 uh, my column comes in Goa also in one of the newspapers and he wrote to me because my email address is underneath and he said, is this the Robert who was my classmate in school? Your writing is the same. <laughs> That's brilliant. The hitting out at the bully in the class slowly turned in my writing to hit out the bullies in the nation. When you learn to stand alone and stand alone for the right, you become more and more, like you use the word powerful, you become more and more into realizing that you can win against the most formidable Goliath. You just need to get the right stone and that is in writing or speaking. Brilliant. I think we had an incredible one hour today. We, we spoke for one hour. Lots of great ideas from you. A lot of amazing thoughts that you brought and laid out for children to to consider. And these are things that are going to grow with them. And, and such experiences in school um, live for a very long time. So any closing words, any closing thoughts for our young children uh, from you will be really nice. I just, uh, since I didn't prepare any closing thoughts or any closing words, I'll just read out the name of my book, which is Dare. Okay, you know what dare is. And I'm going to read out the line which I put over there. 20 dares that helped a shy, skinny, sickly boy face his challenges head on and could, can do the same for you. I was the shy, skin, skinny, thin boy, absolutely scared to face the world. And all I realized is that if I can dare do something against challenges, I can face the world. And then my last line I leave with you and can do the same for each one of you. You can win the world. It's there for you to win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.